Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you for the teaching of your word. Thank you for the way you are leading us from one level to a higher level. Thank you for the way you are teaching us and making us look up so that we can get to a higher ground. We're asking, O oh Lord, that as we look at the word again, we'll not be tired of hearing you in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that our hearts, our ears, our minds, every part of us will be open to listen and hear from you in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you will make us to remember that in your own house, what will be led to your own agenda rather than our own selfish, personal, private agenda. Therefore, Lord, we pray that your name will be exalted and you alone will increase and we will decrease in Jesus name whatever it is in us that wants to compete with you wants to take over from you wants to control what you only ought to control we pray you take it away from us in Jesus name lead us to higher ground in Jesus name we pray We come to consider an important subject in our Bible teaching this morning. And the subject is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is very important. We're very conscious of growth in every other area of life. Growth is both desirable and expected. In fact, everything with life grows in one way or the other. Our parents derive joy in the growth of the children. And our parents lack joy, in fact, and sometimes they express their sorrow. And they do whatever they can do and go all about if they see that instead of growing, we are kind of depreciating. And we have diminutive kind of, of stature. And therefore, they have, they have sorrow because of our lack of growth. God, our Heavenly Father, delights in our spiritual growth also. But when does spiritual growth begin? Because we need to understand, only things that have life can grow. Dead things don't grow. And while we are yet dead in our trespasses and sins, it's not possible to have spiritual growth. Didn't you see that piece of wood that had been cut? And then it's lying on the ground. And instead of growing, how can it grow? It's been cut from the tree. Instead of growing, it becomes rotten or it dries up. And when we're caught away from the true vine, from Christ, and we're not attached to him by faith. And we're not living in the grace of God. We're dead like that branch that is cut off and we cannot grow. Well, then it means the sinner, dead in trespasses and sins, who has never known the Lord and the backslider, who is cut off as a branch from the true vine, cannot grow. We must come back into life. We must be restored into life. There must be eternal life at the very beginning if we're going to grow. The answer to the question, when does spiritual growth begin? When we become born again. But what does spiritual growth consist of? In the physical, in the natural, you understand when a child is born. And that child begins to grow. There's physical growth, social growth too interaction with uh, the brothers and the sisters and mom and dad and everybody around and there's this social interaction and as this child is growing physically we're hoping this child will also grow in interaction social growth with other people too and not only that uh, the, the child begins to pick up some things the use of language how to you know politely ask for something how to share 
not only share your joy and, and share your sorrows, even the, the very manner in which you do that, how to do it, the child begins to grow in wisdom. Isn't that the reason we're told about John the Baptist and the child grew in stature? He also grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with God and with men. That's the same thing we're told about the child Jesus too, that he grew in wisdom, that he grew in stature, that he grew in favor with God, that he grew in favor with men as well. And so, you understand then, when we're talking about spiritual growth, when you become born again, you're identified with Christ, he puts his righteousness into you as he takes your sins away. And then, in your identification with Christ, looking like Christ, and talking like Christ, and praying like Christ, and understanding like Christ, and relating with God like Christ, and obeying like Christ, and doing everything like Christ, you're growing, you're growing, you're growing. And a spirit Spiritual growth, apart from physical, natural, and mental growth. How do we experience and maintain spiritual growth? And the parents want the children to grow. That's why uh, from infancy, they begin to give milk to that child. And begin to give care to that child. And begin to touch that child. Even, even the experience of touching, tenderness. And that, that child is experiencing love. And as the child is experiencing love, the child also is growing in love. And as it happens in our families with mom and dad and the other brothers and sisters, and there are things that happen spiritually in a spiritual family. And those things help us to really grow. And then we begin to see the components and some things in our lives that actually show that we're growing up. And the question you need to be asking yourself as we go through this word of God is, have you started growing? And you make the allowance of a new in your life whereby you can grow. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Here Paul the Apostle, you know, he's been talking about things spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. Verse 1, isn't that spiritual? Verse 2, talking about the gift of prophecy and knowledge and truth and faith. And moving mountains, isn't that spiritual? And verse 3, talking about, you know, I mean, all your goods to feed the poor and all those things. Isn't that spiritual? And then it comes on to describing charity. Isn't that all spiritual and moral? And then he now tells us, when I was a child, don't you understand? It's trying to bring something natural. To describe something supernatural is trying to bring something physical. To describe something spiritual. When I was a child, there were three things that characterized my childhood. Number one, speaking. Number two, uh, number one is that I speak as a child. Number two, understanding. I understood as a child. Number three, I thought as a child. Your very thinking process. Think about those three things, he said. You want to find out whether I am growing or not. Look at what I think about. And look at my pattern of thoughts. Look at my level of understanding. And then look at my speech. My thought, my understanding, and my speech. And he says, when I was a child... I only spoke as a child will speak. Not only the vocabulary are used, even the examples and symbols are used, even the things I communicated and the things I spoke about, not only the channel of communication, but the very content of the communication will show you the level at which I am, the things you talk about. The things you discuss and the things you share. And if you look at your conversation all through the day from the morning till the evening and you compare how you speak today, what you speak about today with how you spoke some years ago, it will show whether you are increasing or decreasing, whether you are growing or you are retrogressing. 
I speak as a child then. I understood as a child. How do you understand matters? How do you understand? When temptations come, when trials come, when testings come to your life, when circumstances change, when situations arise, how do you understand? How do you understand the plan of God? The way of God? What God permits in His wisdom, which He could have prevented in His power? What's your level of understanding? If you are married now, how do you understand the things happening in the family? Your understanding, your level of understanding, that will show whether you are still a child. Understanding as a child. When it appears you are denied of something now, that you may have a greater sin tomorrow. How do you understand that? When you have to go through present pain, so that you can have a future pleasure. How do you understand that? Because you know the child wants present pleasure at the risk of future pain. That's the child. But you know he's saying that when I was a child, that's the way I taught you. And I understood as a child. But now that I'm growing up, now that I become a man, growing up, I put away childish things. And then he said... When I was a child, you know something? I thought as a child. Uh, can, I, can I remind you? Maybe you don't know. Maybe you have not noticed. Your life depends on your thought system. Think about it. Before you came in this morning, you know, you saw something, you began to think. Uh, you even do it unconsciously. But you know something? Sometimes, for many people, their pattern of thinking remains the same as when they were just six years of age, 12 years of age, 14 years of age. The pattern of thinking never changes. They don't understand. Growing up means that the way we think about things, the things we see. Ah, I, I saw something yesterday. And what I thought of yesterday, what I saw yesterday brought a thought in my mind. Today, I saw that same thing. And it brings a different thought into me. Still the same thing that I saw yesterday. You know why? Because today, I have changed from what I was yesterday. So, I may see the same thing. Another day, my growth will help me to think differently of that thing I saw yesterday which I'm seeing today. And so, when we are talking about spiritual growth, spiritual growth will help you to speak, to understand, and to think in a higher way. And we, we, we need to grow. And now Paul the Apostle is saying, and I can see the difference, and I derive joy in the very fact that I'm experiencing spiritual growth because when I was a child, this is the way I did it. Now that I become a man, I put away childish things. Do you know there are people that never, 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 never put away childish things? Oh, you, you know the examples. Uh, they, they multiply. They multiply. Uh, you know, you, you sometimes you know, we, we respect. Um, you know, uh, our everybody. You know, in, in authority, we respect them very much. But uh, you know, sometimes what we read in the papers that when we were in the primary school, if something doesn't please us, that the headmaster has done, this is the way we act. And then when we become to secondary school and the principal doesn't, you know, do something pleasing to us, the same way we acted in primary school, that's the way we act. And then when we get to university and the vice chancellor or whatever, or the government doesn't do what we want, exactly the same way we acted in the primary school, that's the way we act. Ah, more than that. Now, they have elected us to become senators. And then we're there in the Senate, and somebody says, 
what I don't like, what I don't appreciate, I'm now a senator, and I give it to him if I have a bottle, I give it to him if I have only my feast, I give it to him. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Isn't that the way we acted in primary school, secondary school, university, and now over there on top? I'm telling you that when we grow, it's going to be a change. Your speech, your understanding, and your thought, and your action. That's what will reveal the change that is taking place in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world, that ye may grow thereby. It tells us there are, you know, there are things that you desire that you have that you make use of that actually makes you to grow in second peter chapter 3 and in verse 18 but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever and everybody says amen and we're looking at this subject spiritual growth and we're going to divide it into three parts part one concern and commandment on spiritual growth our heavenly father's concern and he gives us commandment on spiritual growth concern and commandment on spiritual growth you know if you are a real child of god and you identify with christ the very mark of that identification will be that the concern that Christ has is a concern that you will have. It's like when we're in the family. And you see your senior brother in the family, the same father, the same mother. And now you are at the university and, you know, your senior brother or senior sister is still battling with GCEO level. It's not growing academically. And your parents are concerned. And if you have the same heart with your parents as they are concerned about this, your senior brother, you'll be concerned as well. Here you are now, lady. And now you're married and you have already three children. And here is your senior sister in the family. She's not married yet. And your parents are concerned. If you have the same heart with your parents, you are going to have the same concern. For this, your senior sister, who has not married, concern and commandment on spiritual growth. Number two, the components of spiritual growth. The components of spiritual growth. Because, you know, many times, if you don't understand and you don't consider the components of spiritual growth, you might think you are growing just because you have more enthusiasm today, more energy today. You can jump, you can run, and, and you do some merry-go-round, and you are not making any progress, not getting anywhere. Just this relative journey that you are, you know, doing that, and you are sweating, and you know, expending energy. And because of that, you think you are growing spiritually. That's why you need to think about what are the components of spiritual growth. Number three, Christian commitment to spiritual growth christian commitment to spiritual growth if you really want to grow it will take commitment it doesn't just come automatically that you know i'm a christian and naturally naturally i will grow don't i grow naturally well, you grow naturally, but you know you eat every day, you take your bath every day, you learn every day, and you learn to do things better to you day by day as the days come and go. And that's how you grow physically. If you're going to grow spiritually too, uh, there is a commitment, Christian commitment, uh, that you put on that spiritual growth. I come back to number one, concern and commandment on spiritual growth concern and commandment on spiritual growth in second peter chapter 3 second peter chapter 3 verse 18 but grow in grace here the apostle tells us 
he commands us and he's commanding us because he's concerned and he's concerned for many many reasons if you read first peter you read it through and you see how the how the believers at that time were going through persecution and peter the apostle was concerned that they will have the right attitude in persecution they'll be able to face persecution joyfully and they'll be able to look at their lives and the direction of their life where they ought to go will not change because of persecution he was concerned and he knew that the only way that will take place for those believers is to grow in grace that's why the lord is telling us many things will happen in your life that will try to distract you derail you that will try to turn you away from the goal, from the purpose, from, from the destination that the Lord has marked for you in life. And except you grow in grace, those little, little, little things will derail you. Because you, you know you are like a child. And when you see a little problem, you say, there is no way there, I cannot go to that place. All you do is just turn aside and find an easier road. Because water seeks, meanders, so as to find the easier road. But it's when you are growing in grace, not only that, because of their commitment that they ought to be like Christ, Christ has left us an example that we should walk in his steps. And Peter knew that if that was going to take place, they will need to grow in grace. The more you desire that you are going to be like Christ, in everything and everywhere, the more you'll find in your life that you need to grow in grace. Not only that, Peter tells them he was getting older. And the Lord was showing him that the time of this departure was at hand. And Peter was getting concerned. We need to hand over these ones, to, these things to successors that will take over from us. And there is no way that you can step into the apostles' shoes and carry on what they have been doing. And not allow that thing to disintegrate. But to move on, there is no way you can do that if you're not growing grace. That's why Peter was telling them, but grow in grace. Not only in grace, you grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. You grow in knowledge. Because there is no way you can really grow in the things of God if you're not growing in knowledge. It's your growth in knowledge that leads to your growth in faith. That leads to your growth in love. That leads to your growth in grace. That leads to your spiritual growth in all its ramifications. And here is the concern as well as a commandment. It wasn't only Peter that had such a, such a concern. And it wasn't only Peter that God used as a channel avenue whereby the commandment of God was passed on to them. We we'll look at First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. I'm looking at verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice? Be ye children, but in understanding be men. Peter uh, had spoken to the people in his own time. And now Paul the Apostle talking to the Corinthian Christians. Corinthian Christians, hey, look at this. Look at this. Look up here, everybody. You know, these Corinthian Christians, they spoke in tongues more than any other church in the New Testament. And you will think that they're speaking in tongues more than any other church in the New Testament made them higher spiritually than all the other churches. No, the Philippian church was higher, grew more than the Corinthian church. And here in the Corinthian church, you have all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. That they even began to compete with one another. This one speaking in tongues, and this one prophesying, and this one manifesting faith, and that one casting out devils, and that one healing the sick over there, and that one giving the word of knowledge. And here another person is shouting, and it's pandemonium. As they're trying in competition, they didn't grow just like children. And then there's so much division among them. 
uh, where you have all this tongue talking and you have all these you know word of knowledge and word of wisdom and all this power they, they were drunk with power and they were just little babes and, and paul the apostle said corinthians i tell you something with all the speaking in tongues and with all the manifestation of the gifts of the spirit i cannot i cannot i cannot write to you as unto matured people, I have to write to you as unto babes. Because I see that all those things, all the noise you are making, you are still babes. That's why it says here, brethren, be not children. I see a lot of childishness among you in understanding. Even look at this. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Severus. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Was this I hear, I see among you? Because they told me from the house of Chloe that there's division among you. When you see that kind of competition, maybe our own competition is not on, I speak in tongues more than you. I cast out devils more than you, but we our campus fellowship they are schools outreach they are children's section oh everybody knows we are better than them everybody knows we are the very nucleus and the kernel of christianity we are the real pillars even if they don't say it we know they know what's that my friend Grow, grow up. You know, little children. It's little children that will, you know, go to the scale every day. And they, they are weighing how heavy they are. How tall they are. They are measuring every day. When you grow up, you stop talking about, you know, those things. You, you don't even remember to, you know, all that thing. A long time. Grow up. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice, be children. That is, you know, little children when, you know, somebody offends them and, you know, they, they might talk and they might say, I'll not play with you again. And then the very next minute, they have forgotten that they said they will not play with you again. They continue to play with you. He said, in malice, be children. You Corinthians, with all your tongue talking, how you keeping malice with one another? Revenge, retaliation. Negative attitude, bitterness. And then, then that's the thing you ought, to, you ought to push aside. Grow up. That was a concern. That was a commandment that the apostle was giving to those people at Corinth. And that's the same thing the Lord is coming to tell you today. What do you think we're going to talk about when we talk about spiritual growth? Uh, you think we're going to be talking about some of these high level tongue talking casting out devils let us grow up if we grow up here all of us we're going to be demon chasers and we will cast out devils and everybody gets excited i'm telling you you can have all that and still not grow up in fact from what we see everywhere here and there within and without the more of these manifestations people have the more of spiritual childishness they reveal and manifest that's why the lord is telling me to tell you like peter told his congregation paul told his congregation he tells me to tell you grow up be not children in understanding how be each in any case, be children in malice, but in understanding, be men. And then he tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets 
and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the maturing of the saints for the spiritual growth of the saints do saints realize today do believers realize today that these ministries and ministers have been given to us for our spiritual growth do students realize today that the lecturers are giving to them for their academic growth progress and do we understand the attitude we ought to have to these ministries and ministers that are placed over us in the church so that we'll be able to grow for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry it is as you have been matured perfected and you experience spiritual growth you get involved in the work of the ministry you know sometimes there are, there are people that even do things in church that will not be permitted out there in the secular field out there in the secular field you will not be granted opportunity to you know be appointed as you know a doctor over there you have not gone through the whole course and you have not you know performed any kind of experiment you have not done anything dissected anything and now you are expecting that he'll make you a doctor and then you'll be cutting people open and you'll be performing operations it's only quad doctors that do that and reasonable people don't expect that you are going to put somebody who has not gone through the medical course to, to put him in an hospital how is it that in the church the people that are not growing spiritually they still expect all the same you are going to put them on the work of god but it says he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and that's why some people you know they, they, they make a, a lot of trouble and it causes confusion and they, they think that well if the man doesn't allow us to do what we want to do in the house of god I know God has called me. I know I can do something. If they don't allow me to do it peacefully, I will do it by force. My friend, there will be no reward for that. And I told you yesterday, you don't, if you are civilized and enlightened and educated, I told you yesterday, you don't come to another person's house and carry out your private agenda. You can't do that. You can't come into the house of God. I'll walk there. I'll be a worker there and I will determine the kind of job I will do whether they appoint me or not I'm going to do it you can't do that this is not your house this is God's house you cannot just bulldoze your way into the house of God and do what you want you will sit down you will learn then you will show us by your humility, by your meekness, by your gentleness, by your faith, by your love, by your obedience, by your submission, by your loyalty, by your faithfulness, by your conduct and Christian character. You will show us that you are growing up spiritually because it is that perfecting, maturing, that gets you ready for the work of the ministry. And then it says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The reason you are involved in the work of the Lord is to edify the body of Christ. Maybe some people forget. You are not here to, you know, destabilize us. Any area of work you are, He has appointed you. Not to cause sorrow to any other part of the work so that we will not be able to lead the church fully into the fullness of the stature of christ you are involved 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Look up here. If you know that God appoints the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher for the growth of the church and you have a part in the work of the Lord in that church and you know that this pastor is going to be instrumental to the spiritual growth of the body of Christ if you have the mind of Christ you are going to do everything in your power everything beyond your power to help and assist and encourage and lift up that preacher, that pastor, so that he can be his best in edifying the body of Christ. That's what we're learning from the Bible. If you don't do that, and you have another agenda, if you don't do that, and you have another motive, you don't love the body of Christ. And you want everything to crumble. Spiritual growth then means your thoughts, your understanding, your speech, your action will come together to show that you understand that we are all there and you are there to help in the building up, the growing up of the body of Christ. That's why it says, till we all come. Verse 13, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that spiritual growth? Uh, one thing, you yourself, you are growing and then you are helping the body of Christ to grow. Hey, that's the reason you, you need to understand. If you have any chance to do anything in the church of the living God, you're helping everybody involved in helping the church to grow and the whole church too. You're helping everyone to grow up until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Then it says in verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children. It comes to that again. Paul, you know, you must remember what he said. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. And now he's telling the Ephesians, he said, that henceforth, as we're receiving the ministry from all these various angles and various gifts of Christ to so the church henceforth, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and, and a cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. You see that growth now? To grow up into him in all things. That's, that's really the direction where your life should be growing. You're growing up, and you're growing up, and you're growing up. And every time you're looking at Christ as a model, as a standard, and you're growing up into him in all things, every area, every area of your life, personal life, and your relationship with other people, your relationship with God, and, and your desires, and your purpose in life, and your goal in life, everything in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supplied, According to the effectual walking in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the defying of itself in love. Spiritual growth. The concern. In Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, reading verse 1. Therefore, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. And you'll see the concern and you'll see the commandment. It says, therefore, what did he say, therefore? Therefore, therefore. And what you see is therefore in the Bible, especially beginning a verse, you need to go back and find out what it is there for. And if you go back, you are going to find in Hebrews chapter 5, the last three verses. It says, let, let, me, let me back up to verse 11. Chapter 5. Of whom we have many things to say and had to be uttered. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. Here the writer to the Hebrews was telling the Hebrew believers, he said, you know, uh, there are many things we need to teach. Many things we need to say. He said, but you, uh, you Hebrew Christians, you get tired easily. And the message becomes too long for you. And you are dull of hearing. And you don't make use of what you have heard yesterday. Because if you made use of what you heard yesterday, there will be a difference in action, a difference, a difference in disposition, a difference in attitude today than it was yesterday. That's why he said, you Christians there, and there are many things we need to tell you, but you are dull of hearing. Then in verse 12, for when? For the time. You ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such, such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, because for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. You know, after he said that, now in chapter 6 he said, therefore, because we will be too long on, you know, this subject, because you, you have not grown up the way you ought to grow up. Because you are not skillful in the use of spiritual things. Now, enough is enough of that. Let's move on. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, so that we're not repenting every day. So that uh, we're not talking about saving faith every day. We should graduate from that now. So that we're not talking about baptisms every day, laying on of hands every day, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment every day. We, we've covered all that. We should know enough of that now. Now let's move on. Go on unto perfection. Not laying again all those foundations. So you see the concern. And you see the commandment of scripture concerning spiritual growth. I go to point number two. Components of spiritual growth. The components of spiritual growth. What does spiritual growth consist of? What are the different parts and the different elements I should be looking for in my life, in the life of my congregation? If actually spiritual growth is taking place, the components of spiritual growth in Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one verse five. In Second Peter chapter one verse five, and beside this. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. The components of spiritual growth. It says, the foundation is faith. You are saved by grace through faith. And now after you've been saved by faith, saving faith, even that faith itself, let it increase. Lord, increase our faith. Even that faith itself, let it increase. Yours is great faith. 
that faith itself, let it increase unwavering faith. That faith itself, let it increase the gift of faith. And that's, that's the evidence that there is spiritual growth taking place. And then it says, to that faith, you will add virtue. Be virtuous. Be virtuous. Be virtuous woman. Be virtuous. Be virtuous man. The virtues of the Christian character. Have you, have you thought about it? You know, even people in the world, they tell us in the places of work, you know, in the olden days, the Athenians, when their children reach the age of 17, they make them to take the oath of Athens. And that oath simply was saying it began with, I will do everything in my power. To build up the image of Athens as a city. And never to do anything that will bring disgrace on this city. And then they went on and on and on talking about the virtues they expected in their young people. And you young people, you are not Athenians. You are Christians. And Christ wants to be shown to the world. And you want to exalt Christ. And build up the image of Christ that the people of the world may believe that the Father has sent the Son. That's why you are going to have virtue. And in all those writings, they tell us, and the Bible tells us too, virtue, honesty, loyalty, compassion, friendship. That's pure, clean fellowship. And then they tell us about self discipline and that you know those Athenians you wonder that even though they were gentiles and still are gentiles they will talk about those things and they will say these are the virtues they wanted to see in their young people as the young people were growing up just to build up the image of that city and if Christ is telling us we represent him he says, I'm the light of the world. And then he turns to us and he says, you are the light of the world. Let them see the light of Christ shining. Add virtue unto your faith. And then to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. Hey, you need knowledge. Hey, we're not talking of the knowledge of chemistry now. You know, a person can know all the chemistry in the world and still end up being a criminal. We're not talking of the knowledge of mathematics now. A person can have all the knowledge of mathematics in the world and, you know, even look like a S10, a physicist, and, and yet you can be a criminal in your life. We're talking about the, the knowledge of Christ and the knowledge of God and the knowledge of righteousness and the knowledge of what it takes to make the world a better place than you met it. You ask yourself, how did I meet the world yesterday? And as I go through the world yesterday and today, when I'm going to leave this world, am I going to make this world a better place to live in? That's the knowledge you need to possess and that's the knowledge you need to exercise. And then it says in verse 6, and to knowledge temperance and self-control and self-discipline. You know, I told you that our lives are made up of thoughts. Thoughts will come to your mind. And there are people that just act. It's like a reflex action. A thought comes to them. And they don't even examine it. Can that be right? Is that appropriate? Is that really needed? Will that edify the body of Christ? Well, that show that I'm growing up in Christ. They will, they will not think, they will not ask any question. The thought comes to them and they just act it out. That's not right. Temperance, self-discipline, self-control. And to temperance, patience. Patience. And we need to be very patient. You know, impatient people, they want to have everything now. Everything now. 
Have you, you don't do so impatient like that. They get into, they get into difficulty. And sometimes, uh, I don't know whether you've heard of all these uh, stories before, but, you know, the people in the, you know, in the, in the world, uh, they try to teach their children with some of those stories to be able to help them to develop the virtues and the patience they ought to develop. And that's why one father was talking to, you know, his child. And the father said, you know, just told the story, made it up to teach his child patience. And he's written it down in some of these books. That a farmer had a goose that laid golden eggs. And once a day, every day, you know, as the father comes, he'll pick up, you know, a golden egg. And he was becoming wealthy and rich. And eventually the farmers thought, ah, this goose has a lot of gold inside. If I can just split it open, then I'll suddenly become the richest man on earth. And why am I going to be waiting for the goose to be laying just one egg a day? One egg a day. So he, just, he grabbed that goose and then slashed it open. And they didn't find anything. He killed the goose and missed the opportunity of having the golden eggs every day. And he tell us that those who are impatient, that's how they kill ideas and kill projects and kill character and kill everything and kill their prospect in life, eventually kill themselves. So, we need to have patience. Because these are the components of spiritual growth. And then he tells us that apart from patience, he says to patience, godliness. Godliness is what makes you to act like God. Ye as dear children, be ye followers of God. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Then he tells us in verse 8, for ye these things be in you and abound. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, that is adding and adding and adding these things, if ye do these things, it says, it shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The components of spiritual growth in second thessalonians chapter one second thessalonians chapter one verse three we are bound to thank god always for you brethren as it is meet suitable because your faith groweth exceedingly spiritual growth it says we give thanks for you. Thessalonians, believe us there. Because we see that your faith is growing exceedingly. And we know our faith is growing exceedingly. When we do not plan our lives on the basis of our doubt. But we plan our lives on the basis of our faith in God. This is the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord told me. I believe him. Every judge, every title of his word. And because I believe him, this is a plan I have. And you keep on basing your plans, basing the projects on that faith. Then your faith is growing. You're experiencing spiritual growth. But if you experience some difficulties, some opposition, to your Christian life, some persecution in your Christian life, 
And then your original vision, intention to live for the Lord and to run the race that is set before you. You know, modify. You modify your actions and your vision and the direction in which you are going and everything based on the doubts you have now. Rather than on the faith, you always add in the Lord. Then it means you are not growing. But when you are growing and your faith is growing, you take your decisions by faith. You don't take your decisions on the basis of, you, you know, the road is rough and the things are difficult and how can I even do that thing anymore? Your faith is growing and you plan your life on the basis of faith, not on the basis of doubt. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another. And toward all men, even as we do toward you. And those are the components of spiritual growth. When you are not increasing in bitterness, in your relationship with your fellow brother, your fellow sister, as the days go by and the weeks go by, you are having more love, more love. You learn to be patient with other people. You learn to understand other people. You learn to make a difference between natural things like, you know, the way somebody walks, the way somebody talks, the way somebody looks, or the appearance of a person. You don't regard all that. What can that fellow do about his look, about her look? That's not her fault. That, that, that's the way she is. But you don't know, make a difference between uh, the character and the appearance. And you love him. You love her. Whatever. And that's, that's, the, that's the increase of love. That, that you're understanding people more. You're patient with people more. You appreciate people more. You relate with people in a, most, in, a, in a better way than you used to do. And it's, you know, not the same thing, the same reaction every time. He didn't smile at me, so I'm going to frown at him. Isn't that the way you did it yesterday? And you do it today the same way. You grow. You grow in love. And the Lord make you increase. And to abound in love. One toward another. And toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end. For the purpose that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness. Before God, even our Father, at the coming, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, verse 10. But as touching brotherly love, as touching brotherly love, no brotherly hatred, as touching brotherly love, no brotherly bitterness, as touching brotherly love, there's no beat, there's no brotherly retaliation, revenge, as touching brotherly love. You know, if we were growing, even without much evangelism, our fellowship will grow, the congregations will grow. And the things we do for God will grow. It will just come. It will just come. When you are growing in faith, and you are growing in love, and you are growing in gentleness, and you are growing in faithfulness, and you are growing in self-control, you know, people get attracted to you. Good things get attracted to you. And, and people, you know, people are fed up in, you know, in life. They're battered, they're sorrowful, and they're looking for solace and consolation. And they, they will come into your fellowship. Just grow in love. Just grow in love. And you'll find that your fellowships will grow. But if we're not growing in love, and we're growing in criticism, 
I were growing in fault finding. I were growing in methods of persecution. If we're not growing in love, and we're growing in all those negative, negative things, people will come to your fellowship. And then they see that, you know, they see all the whatever it is there, and they say, I'm looking for consolation and comfort. I cannot stay in a place like this. You'll be laboring and laboring and laboring. And yet there'll be no growth. Just grow, grow, grow in grace and grow in faith and grow in love and People will get attracted to that fellowship. Look at it again. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, here is our concern. Here is what we are telling you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And that's, it. And that's what he wants us to grow in. Grow. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Colossians 1, 10, that ye might walk worthy. Of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You become fruitful in every good work, every good work. And then you increase in the knowledge, the knowledge of God. Come on to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 29. Verse 19. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. Joy. 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 Not happiness. Joy. Happiness depends on what happens. Joy. Jesus and you, they tell children with nothing in between that as long as jesus is there is the joy of your life and it doesn't your joy doesn't depend on what happened yesterday what does not happen yesterday what did not happen yesterday the privileges they gave me the privileges they don't give me joy the joy of the lord the strength of your life that whatever it is mountains move the seas roar, Nebuchadnezzar frowns, Herod persecutes, the Sanhedrin rises up, the joy of the Lord. Jesus and you with nothing between. When you can have that kind of joy and say, yes, Lord, the greatest of all the blessings I can have is Jesus Christ. Give me Jesus and it is enough for me. When you have that Jesus, and it's your Savior, and it's your Lord, and it's the director of your life, and it's the one that manages everything in your life, Jesus in your life, even if there is nothing else, you have not eaten that day, and you don't know where the meal will come from, the joy of the Lord. When you can rejoice like that, and in fact, in the midst of the deepest distress, the joy of the Lord is there. And that means you are growing. That means you are growing. Because you know earlier, when you were still immature, if there was a little, little inconvenience, a little problem, your joy is gone. And then it's now sorrow and complaint and sadness and, you know, whatever. Even the thought of backsliding. But now, when the Lord Jesus Christ has that central, central place in your life, and you say, Give me Jesus. He is all I want. Take the world and give me Jesus. Jesus is all that I need. And it satisfies. And that satisfaction of the Lord 
becomes the very center of your life. That's growth, spiritual growth. Look at it. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Spiritual growth, the components. I come to point number three. Christian commitment to spiritual growth. Christian commitment to spiritual growth. If we're going to grow, it is going to be commitment to that growth. It's not just wishing to grow, thinking I'm going to grow, desiring to grow, without putting some commitment, consecration into that desire for growth. In First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Christian commitment to spiritual growth. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. If you are committed to spiritual growth, if it's not, you know, just to attend a conference and just to have a conference, you know, sometimes we, we don't think through. And we need to be thinking through, thinking through. When you want to have your conference, what's the goal? What's the purpose of having the conference? Is it just to do it this year? Because we did it last year. We did it the other year. We did it the other year. And to keep to the routine, we need to do it again. Or is there a purpose why we want to have that conference? When you determine the purpose, the goal, the reason why you want to have the conference, when you come into that conference, then you remember this is the goal. This is the reason why we came for the conference. And therefore, we lay aside anything and everything that will hinder us from achieving, accomplishing that goal. Here we're talking about spiritual growth. And if we really are committed to having spiritual growth in our lives, there are things we're going to lay aside. Look at it, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies, all evil speaking. You say there is no all in front of hypocrisy and envy. Yes, you understand, because aren't you students? When you say A into B plus C, that's A, B plus A, C. The A covers everything. The all that you see at the beginning covers everyone. Every form of hypocrisy you lay it aside. Every form of envy you lay it aside. I I'm asking you a question. Why is this child eating and eating and eating as much as this other child? But this child, although he's eating and eating and eating, is growing leaner. And we do not see the evidence of good feeding, good diet on the child. There is something in the system of that child that is not allowing the food that is taken to build up the body. Why is it that people hear the word of God, hear the word of God, hear the word of God, and there is no spiritual growth because there is something in their system that will not allow the word of God they are hearing to build them up. And that's the thing that Peter is telling us, lay them aside. 
malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking. Lay that aside, then you come and you take the sincere milk of the word of God so that you'll be able to grow, that she may grow thereby. In Proverbs chapter 9, Proverbs chapter 9, I'm reading verse 9 there, Proverbs 9, verse 9, give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser, give instruction to a wise man. You know, wise people, they, they know that they need to know more. Haven't you learned about Socrates in your, is it your philosophy or whatever? And near the very end of the life of uh, Socrates, he was uh, discussing with another one. And he rated Socrates as like the wisest in, in, in their world at that time. And then Socrates said, the more I know, the more I know, how unwise I am. That's a wise man. That's a wise man. The more I know, the more I know that I'm unwise. And he said, if there's anybody that says he is wise and has gone to the pinnacle of wisdom, that fellow knows nothing as he ought to know. When you are wise, you're asking the Lord, I want to grow in that wisdom. Therefore, you will receive instruction. It will not be an attitude of, I knew that before. I read that before. I preached that myself before. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. A person that wants to grow spiritually, you will be committed to that spiritual growth. And you will like to learn. Mark. Mark chapter 4, the believer's commitment, Christian commitment to spiritual growth. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the world, and it becometh unfruitful. If you are committed to spiritual growth, you will notice in your life the reason why the dew of the morning is passed away at noon. You will notice why the effect of the last conference is gone after the first week of the conference. So we're noticing your life, the effect of the prayer and the blessing that you received in a previous meeting is gone, evaporated before the following meeting. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the loss of other things entering in choked the world. And it becomes so fruitful. And that's why if you happen to be a leader on a campus, and you know that on the campus, you know the cares of this world. You know the deceitfulness of riches. And you know the, the cares of lust of other things entering in. You are going to take care that you don't just preach. You make it practical and deal with all those things that will destroy spiritual life so that the watch of God will bear fruit in the lives of the people. And sometimes if you notice, some people expect me that, you know, just preach simple. Give us the word. But limit it. And all these other things we are branching into. Leave all that alone. No, I cannot leave that alone. Because if I just preach to you, and I know the cares of the world is there, and I know the deceitfulness of your human heart there, and we don't deal with that, and we know the impatience that is there, and we don't deal with it, 
and all the other things that will choke the world. And we don't deal with that. We'll just preach and be, there'll be no effect. That's why it takes time for the farmer to cultivate his land. And very slowly and patiently, and remove all the weed and all the thorns and all the cares of this life and all those civil things, and then before you will really be able to plant. And then in verse 20 it says, And these are they which are sown on good ground. Cares of the world rooted out. The thorns of the loss for all the things rooted out. And all those pebbles of the deceitfulness of riches taken off. Now it's a good ground. He sows the word now into this good ground. And then it tells us in that verse 20, Such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, is in this growth thirtyfold and sixtyfold and hundredfold. We need to grow. By the grace of God, we will grow. In Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40. I'm reading from verse 28. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the, of the earth, of earth, of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. You have been fainting before you came. And your concern as you came to the conference is that you want to renew your strength. God will renew your strength. You want to have power over the things that made you to fall before you came. You will have power. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. That's the spiritual growth we're talking about. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that do what? Tell me out loud. Please tell me out loud. If we come to the conference like this. And we cannot wait on the Lord. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? To just wait there. And if God wants to say anything to you, wait there. They that wait on the Lord. And when God finishes speaking to us, we speak to him, spend time, wait on the Lord. That's why I count it very destructive and counterproductive. If we come to a conference like this, and there's no time to teach the word of God, and we're impatient. That's why I count it a waste of time, counterproductive, negative. If after the preaching of the word of God, we don't have time to pray. And there are some young, young people that will deliberately want to do something to just stop the prayer. That's enough, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. Children in understanding. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you want to renew your strength this morning? I mean, for the Lord to just pick you up and cleanse you and, and renew you and all these things we're talking about, just inject it into you. To renew your strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the day. I'm looking for the time. When all of us here, you'll run the race, you will not be weary. 
And then you will walk and you will not fade. And instead of just walking, instead of just riding bicycle, instead of using motorcycle, instead of using a spiritual car, you get into a spiritual aeroplane and you mount up with wings as eagles. And then there is no mountain that can stop your movement. And there is no hindrance and there is no road blob that can stop you because you are now at a higher level and you are mounting up with wings as eagles. It can begin this morning. I said it can begin this morning. How many people there you are really willing you want to grow? You want to grow spiritually. All these that we are talking about, you want to wait on the Lord this morning and you want to renew your strength and you want to mount up with wings as eagles and you want to run and not be weary and you want to walk and you don't want to fade and all the tiredness of the past, all the weakness of the past, all the sluggishness of the past, all the lukewarmness of the past, you want the Lord to just come and blow everything away from your life. You want to grow spiritually wait on the lord wait on the lord wait on the lord let him do something let him do something that when you come when you get back home you get back to your campuses things will change wait on the lord I want you to talk to the Lord and ask God himself to help you to grow in faith. To grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to grow. We have to grow. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. I just thank God for all his provision. I just Great.